Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Giving praise and honor to your whole our God, the King of the universe, thanking him for the opportunity to be alive and to be able to know that he is the God that created the heavens and the earth. Also thanking him for the opportunity to go into his word, to study the holy scriptures, and to be able to go into the history of the nation of Israel, the good as well as the bad that happened with us and that came forth from us, and to be able to learn the lessons from, the, from our history so that we may le learn how to advance in the future. We ask that the Most High God will continue to protect the nation of Israel, that he, would, that he would also continue to teach us and guide us in the way that we should walk before him. And we thank him for allowing us to have his word be alive, for allowing us to have the opportunity to read his word, to obtain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, so that that will overall benefit us as we go into his word, for his teachings is, is life and is health unto us. And once again, we could learn from the mistakes of our forefathers and learn how to protect ourselves against sin and carrying forth in our lives in the future. And that relates to the portion that we will read this day, the portion of Korach, found in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, concluding with the book of Numbers, chapter 18, where we will read concerning the rebellion of Korach and the men that stood with him against Moses, against Aaron, and ultimately, standing against them, they stood against the Most High God, Yehovah, who brought us out of Mitzrayim and led us in the wilderness up to the point that we will read it at this time. So we ask that the Most High God will be with the entire nation of Israel, that he will forgive us our iniquities, our transgressions, and our sins, so that we may move forward before him, doing that which is good and right in his sight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the book of Numbers, chapter 16, verse 1. Rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohah, the son of Levi, with, da with Dathan and, Ab and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up in face of Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 men. They were princes of the congregation, the elect men of the assembly, men of renown. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and Jehovah is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the assembly of Jehovah. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. So immediately we start to read about another rebellion in the nation of Israel. As we go throughout the portion and as we see as we came out of the land of Egypt, and as we journeyed from Mount Sinai, the portions continue to talk about the rebellions, of the, the rebellions of the nation of Israel in the wilderness. We recently read about the rebellion of the spies and how that, that caused the entire nation of Israel to rebel against the Most High God by not wanting to go into the land of Canaan to take it over, which was the land that was given unto us. And now we read about Korak, and it gives his genealogy and basically, we know from that that he is the cousin of Moses and Aaron. So it's people within his own family that are rising up against him. And that will, you know, causes, you know, people to feel hurt even more when someone in your own family stands against you. And, you know, Moses automatically fell upon his face because everything became a shock to him. Because he already knows about the rebellions that took place earlier. But now all of a sudden, you know, his own family member gathered up people, you know, mainly from the tribe of Reuben, and it mentioned that they had, you know, princes along with them of the nation of Israel standing up with Korak against Moses, against Aaron, and they're speaking concerning the priesthood as we will continue to read, for they're standing up against Moses and primarily against Aaron, and Moses is going to respond to them in a way to let them know that they do have enough, that the Levites have their portion from Jehovah as well as Aaron has his portion from Jehovah. So Moses is going to try to calm down the situation, but he fell out automatically upon his face, you know, probably in prayer, but he's going to speak it to Korak and to his company, saying. Verse 5. And he spoke unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, In the morning, Jehovah will show who are his, and who is holy, and who will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he may choose will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take you census, Korah and all his company, 
and put fire therein and put incense upon them before Yehovah tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom Yehovah doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Hear now, ye sons of Levi, is it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of Jehovah, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them, and that he hath brought thee near, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee? And will ye seek the priesthood also? So we see from here that that really is what was in Korach's mind, that he gathered up the men that were with him, the other Levites, people from the tribe of Reuben, the princes of the nation of Israel. And from Moses' response, we see that Korach came against them in order to seek the priesthood. You know, he gave the speech that all of the nation of Israel is holy, which we do know and understand because God separated us to be a holy nation, to be a kingdom of priests. So it's understood that everyone in the nation of Israel is holy unto the Most High God. But God at the same time has people in certain positions that other people aren't able to cross into. And, and people have certain positions that people aren't, aren't able to attain to, such as the priesthood and such as the high priesthood, which we know that from reading previously in the Holy Scriptures, this comes from Aaron, Moses' brother, and through that lineage after that. And also Moses letting the Levites know that God gave them their portion out of all the people of the, of the nation of Israel. We read in the book of Numbers, chapter 8, the portion that was given to the Levites and how they were separated. They weren't even counted amongst the nation of Israel by their numbers. They weren't given an inheritance of land in the land of Canaan that was given unto us. But their inheritance is Jehovah. So Moses is letting them know that they do have a special portion and they should, they should be content with the portion that they receive. Korach being one of those of the family of the Kohatites, that he should, Moses is letting them know that he should be content with the portion that's given unto him and let Aaron be content with the portion that's given to him as well. But Korach is probably taking it you know, as an occasion because we know that Moses is the brother of Aaron, and Korach is also trying to play on the minds of the people, saying that Moses probably selected Aaron as a form of nepotism because that was his brother, and that's why he put him in that place. So Korach is able to get these people and gather up the people by speaking against Moses, but ultimately, as we see here, he's seeking the priesthood because he's probably seeing that that's a position that he should have. But Moses is letting him know and let everybody else know that to be content with the portion that they have. And that's the lesson that we should all learn as well, that we should be content with the portion that the Most High God has given us in our lives. God gives everybody their position. Everybody, he gives everybody their portion. He gives everybody everything that they need to do. So everybody must be content with what they, what they receive from the Most High God and utilize it to the best of their abilities without trying to step on someone else's shoes to try to step in someone else's shoes and to fill positions that the Most High God has not given unto us. Verse 11, Therefore thou and all thy company that are gathered together against Jehovah, and as to and as to Aaron, what is he that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? to kill us in the wilderness, but thou must needs make thyself also a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wrong and said unto Jehovah, Respect not thou they offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, be thou all, be thou all thy congregation, and all thy congregation before Jehovah, thou and they, and Aaron tomorrow, and take ye every man his fire pan, and put incense upon them, and bring ye before Jehovah every man his fire pan, two hundred and fifty fire pans, thou also and Aaron each his fire pan, and they took every man his fire pan, and put fire in them and laid incense thereon, and stood at the door of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah assembled all the congregation against them unto the door of the tent of meeting, and the glory of Jehovah appeared unto all the congregation. So initially when this challenge came forth to Moses and Aaron, 
Moses told them, Korak and all of his company and all of the princes that were with him, all of the men that were with him, from, even from the tribe of Reuben, to get their fire pans and to get incense. And he said that tomorrow, you know, we will see who, who Jehovah has chosen to stand as the high priest. We will see who the Most High God has chosen to be in that holy position. And he, Moses probably gave them that opportunity to say, you know, when he said, come back tomorrow, you know, in order to try to quell that rebellion, to give them an opportunity to think about what they were doing, as opposed to saying, you know, let's do this right now. He initially told them, let's do this tomorrow. And even when he spoke to Korak and Korak didn't change his mind, he tried to go to Dayton and Abiram and tried to appeal to them. And they even, you know, you know, were insolent just the same way that Korak was insolent. And they even went further in speaking against Moses and told him that he has taken up, you know, initially they, they all said that Moses has taken too much upon himself. And then Dayton and Abiram at this point, after Moses is trying to appeal to them, saying that Moses didn't bring them into the land, you know, that he was supposed to bring them into. But we already understand that the reason why they haven't gone further into the land is because of the rebellion of the spies and how that caused the Most High God to be angry with the entire nation and caused the nation to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. But they're using that occasion to say that that was Moses' fault and saying that Moses brought them out of the land of milk and honey with them referring to Egypt as the land of the milk and honey, which is an insult to the Most High God because he called the land of Israel the land of, the mil of, the land of milk and honey that he's given unto us. But we see, you know, repeatedly throughout, you know, our reading that the minds of the nation of Israel at this time is always focused on going back into Egypt. And that because Egypt is all that they knew, they thought of Egypt as that great land. So even that insult, you know, was, was one that was harsh that caused Moses to be angry and ultimately caused the Most High God to be angry when they referred to Egypt as the land of milk and honey that they claimed that Moses brought them out of. Not real, you know, not recalling that it was the prayers of the entire nation of Israel to the Most High God that caused the Most High God to take notice of them and to recognize the pain that they, and the anguish that they were in. And then the Most High God is the one that brought the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt in order to bring them into the true land of milk and honey, which is the land of Israel. So Moses put forth this challenge unto them. And then all the following day, they came forth with their fire pans and with their incense. And Aaron was, was also among those who brought forth his fire pan and his incense because this was to show who the Most High God has chosen. And we're going to see here from the events that take place who the Most High God has chosen. Yehovah threatens to consume the congregation, verse 20. And Yehovah spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and will thou be wroth with all the congregation? So Yehovah became automatically angry at the entire nation of Israel at this point. Because even though it was Korak and his people, that stood up in the face of Moses and Aaron, he also was able to appeal to the minds of the nation of Israel who came forth with him because it's it mentioned that Korach assembled all the congregation against, against Aaron and Moses at the door of the tent of meeting when they came forth that next day to bring forth their fire pans and their incense. So Korach was able to muster up, you know, many of the nation of Israel to go on his side based on the speech that he was given unto them you know, prior to the day that he came forth upon Moses and Aaron, and even all of, that, all of that night, being able to muster up the people to go forth to stand in the face of Moses and Aaron. So God became angry at this point, seeing that all of the, these people have come before Moses and Aaron to challenge the position that God has given them. So, so Jehovah became automatically angry, and he told Moses and Aaron, stand back because he's going to wipe out the entire nation. But Moses, even though he was angry the day prior, as we read, he still is always in a humble position to pray on behalf of the nation of Israel, that he never wants to see anyone die in the nation of Israel. He, Moses was always concerned with the people. He knew, he knew that sin had to be eradicated from the nation of Israel, but overall he was always concerned with the people. And when God had told him to stand back so he could wipe out the nation, Moses automatically you know, prayed to the Most High God on behalf of the nation. Verse 23, Punishment of the Rebels. And Jehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke unto the congregation, saying, 
Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be swept away in all their sins. So they got them up from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of, the, of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that Jehovah has sent me to do all these works, and that I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, and be visited after the visitation of all men, then Jehovah have not sent me. But if Jehovah make a new thing, and the ground open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that I pertain unto them, and they go down alive into the pit. Then ye shall understand that these men have despised Jehovah. So God automatically responded to Moses' prayer, and then he told Moses at this time to tell the nation of Israel to stand away from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their company, because what he's about to bring down is just gonna is gonna touch them. So and anybody around them that's still going to stand with them is going to fall into the same punishment that God is going to give unto them. So Moses was able to pray on behalf of the nation of Israel to the Most High God. God responded and gave the, the nation of Israel an opportunity to turn away because we see that, that something happened. We read earlier in the chapter when they brought forth their fire pans that the glory of the Most High God appeared at the door of the tent of meeting. So we know that at that time, everybody was at the door of the tent, the door of, the tent of meeting. But after the Most High God became angry, we see that everybody, you know, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they flit, they went to their tents because this is when Moses, Aaron, and the elders went to their, to their tents and told the children of Israel to stand away from their tents because what's about to happen is going to touch everyone that's around them. And Moses spoke forth and said that he's not the one that brought forth all of these things. And he's talking about the things that occurred from the time that they were in the land of Egypt even up until this point, that he's making it known to the nation of Israel that it was not of his mind to bring all of those things to pass, but it was from Jehovah who brought all of those things to pass because this was part of the speech also that Korach, and, as well as the other men, were speaking against Moses, that Moses was the one that did all of these things, that he's the one that brought you know, the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt and caused them to, dwell, to you know, wander in the wilderness. But Moses is making it known to them that Jehovah is the one that's in charge and that he's the one that you know, commands Moses, all of the things that he has done. So he's also saying that if these men die a common death, it is a sign that Jehovah didn't send them. But if the ground open up underneath them, those that are sinning at this point and swallow them up alive and close back up, that is the sign to the nation of Israel that Jehovah is the one that sent Moses to do the things and to put forth, put forth the tasks that he has done up until this point where they are at this time. Verse 31. And it came to pass as he made an end of speaking all these words that the ground did cleave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men that appertain unto Korah and, unto, and, and all their goods. So they and all that appertain to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the assembly and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them for they said, lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came forth from Jehovah and devoured the 250 men that offered the incense. So the judgment came immediately. And the nation, the nation of Israel had an opportunity to flee. And the ground opened up and swallowed Korak and his company. And also the men, the 250 men that stood up with him, they died not by the earth swallowing them, but they died with a fire coming from the most I got upon them. So all of the sinners that stood up at, you know, the previous day against Moses and Aaron, they're the ones that died. And that's how Moses prayed unto the most I God, praying that only those that sin, that they should die and not the entire nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel that is, that is round about saw all of this happening. So they will also have to be fearful of, you know, coming forth and trying to challenge the most I God as well, because they seen the ground open up and they heard, those that were swallowed up, even, you know, crying out, even within the earth before they died, you know, under the earth. So everybody became fearful and everybody started to flee because they, all, they started considering, you know, what was in their mind that caused them to even, you know, follow Korak, you know, as, as he was challenging Moses and Aaron. And they started to flee because they said the earth may open up and swallow them as well. So God, you know, brought forth swift judgment against those that sinned against them because also bearing in mind that at the time, 
the Most High God dwells in the midst of the nation of Israel. So judgment was always swift. You know, once we have God dwelling in the midst of us and we do wrong, judgment would always be swift. So we see here that God punished these sinners that stood up against Moses and stood up against Aaron, trying to challenge their position and not, you know, considering that it was the Most High God that brought forth everything to pass. Numbers chapter 17, verse 1. Censers are made into plates to cover the altar. And your host spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the fire pans out of the burning and scatter down the fire yonder. But they are become holy. Even the fire pans of these men who have sinned at the course of their lives, and let them be made beaten plates for a covering of the altar. For they are become holy because they were offered before Jehovah, that they may be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen firepans, which they that were burnt had offered, and they beat them out for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, to the end that no common man that is not of the seed of Aaron draw near to burn incense before Jehovah, that he fear not as Korah and has his company, as Yahweh spoke unto him by the hand of Moses. So whether someone offers according to the commandment of the Most High God, which is a good thing, or someone tries to offer to the Most High God, you know, against the, the word of the Most High God, what someone has brought forth to the Most High God is still considered holy. So all of the fire pans of the men that brought, you know, brought forth their incense unto the Most High God, even though God slew all of them, the fact that they brought forth their fire pans as an offering to the Most High God made those fire pans still holy. So therefore, they, though the use of them had to be continued on for a holy purpose. So God commanded that Eleazar, you know, the son of, of Aaron, the high priest, that he would collect all of the fire pans and that he would make the, those fire pans into, a, into plates, which they were used to cover the altar, the altar that, you know, was in the courtyard where the offerings were brought forth. And once that covering is on the altar, people would see that and that would be a sign unto the entire nation of Israel you know, once they see this brand new cover on the altar, that they will remember that that, that that covering came because of the fire pans that were brought forth, you know, by the men that brought forth that offering unto the Most High God. So those men died, but the fire pans that they brought forth were still considered holy. So that will also be in the minds of the nation of Israel when they bring forth their offerings, that they would know that there's a certain point that they would have to stop when they're bringing forth their offerings, and that they would know that there's, you know, only but so much that they would do in the courtyard of the Most High God. That we know that when, every, when anyone brings forth an offering of a beast, they will slaughter their own beast. But from then on, the priests are the ones that take it from there and put it upon the altar. And as we re continue to read here, we will, it will make it clear that the priests have their functions, the Levites have their functions, and the nation of Israel has their functions. And no one is allowed to overstep their bounds to try to take you know, the place of the priests, the place of the Levites, you know, in anything. And we read early in the book of Numbers that any stranger, meaning anyone that is not a priest or a Levite, would be put to death if they try to do, do any of the duties of the priests or of the Levites. Verse 6, the glory of Jehovah appeared. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of Jehovah. And it came to pass, when the congregation was assembled against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of Jehovah appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And Jehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take thy fire pan, and put fire therein from off the altar, and lay incense thereon, and carry it quickly unto the congregation, and make atonement for them, for there's a wrath going out from Jehovah. The plague is begun. So this is the case where the wrath of the Most High God came immediately, and Moses didn't have, a t have enough time to pray. So therefore, he knew that the plague was already gone out. So he's going to command Aaron to do this thing, to go forth with the fight, you know, with his incense, to try to, you know, appease the, uh, appease the Most High God, and to, you know, stop the plague that's already started. But we see that here that once again, the nation of Israel, even the following day, after seeing the great sight with Korak, Dathan and Abiram being swallowed in the earth, seeing fire come forth and consume the 250 men, that there was still murmuring 
amongst the nation. So all that night, people continued to murmur, continued to complain. Probably started from the immediate family, spread throughout the nation, and they came forth the following day and accused Moses and Aaron of killing or murdering, I should say, the people of the Most High God. They said that you came forth and you killed the people of Jehovah. So they blaming Moses and Aaron for the lives of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and the 250 men that were with that were with them, but not realizing and not remembering that it was their own sin that caused their own death, and that Moses was the one that tried to speak to them. You know, before all of that wrath came, he gave them a day, you know, to cool down, and they still continued to persist in going forth and trying to challenge the Most High God. So all of this wrath came directly from the Most High God unto them. So now that this following day after all of these events took place, the, the day after, the nation was scared because they, they fled when they saw the, the earth open up and when fire came forth. But automatically, you know, the people calmed down and they started to complain against the Most High God and directly against Moses and Aaron even at this time. And God didn't give Moses the opportunity to pray. You try to stop the plague. God brought forth the plague immediately and Moses had the time telling Aaron, you know, you have to take your incense and go forth in the midst of the people and try to appease the anger of the Most High God. So Moses and Aaron now are playing their part in trying to stop the plague that is attacking the nation of Israel, even though they know that the nation of Israel is the one that is attacking them. So this is showing humility on both their, on both parts, on both Moses and Aaron, that regardless of who came up against them, they were still willing to pray on behalf of those that came against them and trying to appease the wrath of the Most High God. And, you know, constantly we see all the time with all of these rebellions where it says that the glory of the Most High God appeared unto the children of Israel. And that's all that, you know, that's written. We don't know exactly what that was. But we know that once that appeared, people became, you know, became scared and a play began after that point. So whatever this glory is, it was something that was, you know, frightful in the sight of the nation of Israel. And it caused Moses at the time to tell Aaron to do what he's, you know, what he did at this point. Verse 12, Aaron stays the plague. And Aaron took, as Moses spoke, and ran into the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died by the plague were 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tent of meeting, and the plague was stayed. So 14,700 people died just that quickly. Just, you know, with enough time, you know, Aaron only had enough time to get his fire pan, put incense upon it, and to run, you know, out into the camp to try to make atonement for the nation of Israel. Just within that motion, you know, however long that took, you know, whether it was a few minutes or, you know, probably up to an hour, 14,700 people died, you know, from a plague at that moment. And Aaron was able to stop the plague by doing what he did at this time and gaining atonement for the nation of Israel. And that's the job of the high priest. And that's the job also of all of the priests to gain atonement for the nation of Israel, you know, through offerings and through prayer. So Aaron, you know, stayed on his job all the time, even though people tried to take his place, even though, you know, it was his cousin also that stood up against him prior, you know, the day prior and tried to take his job. And even though the nation of Israel stood on behalf of his cousin who tried to come against him, he still, you know, put all of that aside and still wanted to pray and make atonement for the nation of Israel and still, and still, still followed the orders of Moses' brother and got the incense that went forth and went, you know, made that atonement so that the plague would be stopped, so that the, that the dying in the nation of Israel would have continued. Verse 16, Aaron's rod blossoms, and Jehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of them rods, one for each father's house, of all their princes according to their father's houses, twelve rods. Thou shalt write every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for there shall be one rod for the head of their father's houses, and thou shalt lay them up in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you, and it shall come to pass that the man whom I shall choose, his rod shall bud, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against you. And Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, and all their princes gave him rods, for each prince one, 
according to their fathers' houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before Jehovah in the tent of the testimony. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses went into the tent of the testimony. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and put forth buds and blossom, and bloom and blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before Jehovah unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. So Jehovah put forth this test so the nation of Israel could see it. And he said that, you know, there should be 12 rods gathered up, one rod for each of the tribes of the nation of Israel, and that Levi would be counted amongst the, the 12 tribes at this time. So we know that for Ephraim and Manasseh, there would be only one rod for the tribe of Yosef at this time, being that we know that Levi is being, count, it's being counted, you know, amongst the 12. So the prince from each tribe, you know, would write their name upon their rod and bring forth their rods unto Moses, and Moses will put their rods into the tent of meeting, and Moses is going to let letting them know that the rod that buds, that that's the, that, that's the tribe that God has chosen. And being that Aaron's name is upon the rod of Levi, that it will show that Aaron has been chosen by the Most High God to be the high priest. All of that, the things that we read in here, you know, that took place in the, these three days was because people were angry at, you know, of course, being it stuck in the wilderness, but also because they were angry at the fact that Aaron was the high priest and that he was chosen for that position. And they felt that, you know, Moses was the one that put him in that position. But Moses is constantly making it known that he didn't make that he didn't make that decision, that it was God that made that decision. Even though, you know, they knew about the coronation, they seen the whole procedure because Moses brought the entire nation of Israel out when Aaron and his sons were anointed as high priests and that they went through that procedure for seven days and that the fire came down from the Most High God and, you know, lit the altar, that all of that was done in the sight of all of the people. But the people still didn't trust Moses at this point. So God brought forth this, you know, final test to say that he's going to try to, he's going to end the murmurings of the nation of Israel concerning who he has chosen to be high priest and concerning who he has chosen to be the priest and concerning the tribe of Levi, who he has chosen to be special unto him amongst the nation of Israel. So they went forth and they put forth their rods. And then in the, in the next day, Moses brought back all of the rods of the, the 12 tribes and everybody saw that the rod of Aaron had bloomed blossoms and that it even, you know, but, you know, brought forth almonds upon his rod. And that was a sign so that all people would know that God has chosen Aaron and God has chosen the tribe of Levi. And that was to be done so that that would stop all of the murmurings against the tribe of Levi and against Aaron. Verse 25, Aaron's rod of memorial. And Jehovah said unto Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept there for a token against the rebellious children, that there may be made an end of their murmurings against me, that they die not. Thus did Moses, as Jehovah commanded him, so did he. So Jehovah is telling Moses that that rod no longer belongs to Aaron, that this rod is now going to be a sign forever. So that rod, you know, that, that blossomed will be placed before the Ark of the Covenant. And whenever there were murmurings in the nation of Israel, Concerning Aaron, you know, in the generations to come, they will be able to go forth and get that rod and show the children of Israel that this is this is who the Most High God has chosen, and this is a sign of who God has chosen, you know, because He allowed Aaron's rod to bud. So therefore, generation after generation, they would know that the priesthood comes from Aaron and through Aaron's sons, and that the high priest would come from Aaron's sons, and all of them would know and understand that the tribe of Levi had their portion also you know, with ministering unto the priest and ministering at the tent of meeting. So God put, put, put forth this sign, you know, for the nation of Israel, for generation after generation, to end the murmurings that may occur in generations to come afterwards. Verse 27, the fear of the people. And the children of Israel spoke unto Moses, saying, Behold, we perish, we are undone, we are all undone. Everyone that cometh near that cometh near unto the tabernacle of Jehovah is to die. Shall we wholly perish? So the children of Israel, you know, once again, after seeing all of this death and the destruction around them, for all of those that tried to challenge the Most High God and all of those that tried to approach the tent of meeting, that they all became fearful. And that it's not, you know, 
God didn't say that they're going to die by just approaching the tent of meeting. It's just the way that you approach the tent of meeting. All of the people that died, you know, on the, you know, the prior two days died because of what they did and trying to challenge Moses and trying to challenge Aaron and ultimately trying to challenge the Most High God and trying to take, take the position away from Moses and away from Aaron. So those that approach the tent of meeting, not in the manner that is prescribed unto them, those are the ones that are going to die because God already laid the format of who's going to do what, you know, amongst the priests, amongst the Levites, and amongst the nation of, Yisra amongst the nation of Israel. So therefore, but, you know, all of the fear, you know, came upon them at this time because, you know, after you see a lot of death and a lot of destruction and all of these signs taking place, even up until the, the last sign with the rod budding, and they know that they were not chosen, that they would be fearful, but they, it would just teach them how to approach the Most High God and teach them also how to approach the tent of meeting. And God is going to make it known as we read this next chapter, exactly the roles of the priests and the Levites and what they're supposed to do. Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. Duties of the priests and Levites. Yeho and Jehovah said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's houses, house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou near with thee, that they may be joined unto thee, and minister unto thee, thou and thy sons with thee, being before the tent of testimony. And they shall keep thy charge and the charge of all the tent. Only they shall not come nigh unto the holy furniture and unto the altar, that they die not, neither they nor ye. And they shall be joined unto thee, and keep the charge of the tent of meeting, whatsoever the service of the tent may be. But a common man shall not draw nigh unto them, unto you. And ye shall keep the charge of the holy things and the charge of the altar, that there be wrath no more upon the children of Israel. And I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. For you they are given as a gift unto Jehovah to do the service of the tent of meeting. And thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priesthood in everything that pertaineth to the altar and to that within the veil, and ye shall serve. I give you the priesthood as a service of gift, and the common man that draweth nigh shall be put to death. So Jehovah is putting all of this in the hands of Aaron also, that he's supposed to protect his priesthood, that it's not going to always be a situation where people overstep their, their boundaries and try to approach you know, Aaron and try to approach the things and try to approach the holy things that they're not supposed to take, you know, take hold of, that, and that God is automatically going to always bring forth judgment, as we read prior, that God is telling Aaron that it's his responsibility also to protect his priesthood. And he's also making it known to him that he gave him, the Levites, you know, the tribe that he belongs to, you know, to help him to protect, you know, all of the holy things, you know, of the tent of meeting. But the Levites themselves aren't allowed to touch the, the, the holy articles themselves. They're allowed to protect it, but they're not allowed to touch it. Is upon the priests to go forth and bring forth the offerings upon the altar, to be able to go into the tent of meeting, to light the menorah when it's supposed to be lit, to light the incense upon upon the incense altar, to put the showbread you know the showbread on the showbread table, to and it's upon Aaron the high priest to go into into the holy of holies once a year on the day of atonement, the day of Yom Hakipurim. So all of these things pertain to the priests and the Levites. You know their portion is to bear the burdens. You know, of the tent of meeting, they, you know, to carry, as you know, it was stated in Numbers chapter 8 and also earlier in Numbers chapter 3 and 4, and the families of the Levites and their responsibilities that the Levites kn knew what they had to do. And they had to protect their positions because they said any common man that came forth would be put to death, and any common man would be anyone of the nation of Israel that is not a priest and that is not a Levite. So, and also, they would die for not protecting their position as well. So it's not only that the children of Israel would die when they come near, but the priests' lives are at stake as well for not protecting their position. So now God is putting it in the hands of the priests and also in the hands of the Levites to make sure that they do their duties and that even amongst them, they don't cross their boundaries. So the priests directly handle the holy articles and take care of the holy matters. And then a portion of the Levites is to minister unto the priests and to make sure that their job is protected 
and to make sure that they have their responsibilities taken care of for the tenth of meeting. Verse 8, portions of the priest. And Yehoah spoke unto Aaron, and I, behold, I have given thee the charge of my heave offerings, even of all the hollow things of the children of Israel, unto thee have I given them for a consecrated portion, and to thy sons as a do forever. This shall be thine of the most holy things, reserved from the fire, every offering of theirs, even every meal offering of theirs, every sin offering of theirs, and every guilt offering of theirs, which they may render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. In a most holy place shall thou eat thereof, every male may eat thereof, it shall be holy unto thee. And this is thine, the heave offering of their gift, even all the wave offerings of the children of Israel, I have given them unto thee, and to thy sons, and to thy daughters with thee, as a do forever. Everyone that is clean in thy house may eat thereof. So the portions that we read here that are given unto the priests were read in more detail in the book of Leviticus, the book of Yikra, concerning where it says here, the, you know, the offerings of the children of Israel, you know, the portions, the, there's certain portions that are designated for the priest to eat. So of the, the male offerings, you know, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings, as, as it is mentioned here, that there's a cer certain portion of it that goes to the priests that will offer it. And for certain male offerings, we know that that could be, you know, distributed amongst the other priests as well. And then there are other offerings, as I mentioned, the wave offerings and the other gifts of the nation of Israel, that that could go forth to all priests, as well as their, you know, their wives and their daughters, all of them that are clean could partake of those, you know, offerings. So there's certain offerings that only the priests can partake of, and they have to eat it in a holy place. And then there are other offerings that could be distributed amongst all of the, the priestly family, you know, male as well as female, and they could eat it as long as they are clean. So, and then we're going to continue to read concerning other portions that are given to the priests. But it was just specifying here that there's certain offerings that are most holy and that the priests have to be eat them in a holy place. And that there were certain offerings that anyone in the priestly family can eat as long as they're clean. Verse Verse 12, all the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the corn, the first part of them which they give unto Yehovah, to thee have I given them, the first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring unto Yehovah, shall be thine. Everyone that is clean in thy house may eat thereof. Everything devoted in Israel shall be thine. Everything that openeth the womb of all flesh which they offer unto Jehovah, both of man and beast shall be thine. How be it, the firstborn of man shall thou surely redeem, and the firstling of unclean beasts shall thou redeem. And their redemption money from a month old shall thou redeem them. Shall be according to thy valuation five shekels of silver, after the shekel of the sanctuary, the same as twenty geras. But the firstling of an ox, or the firstling of a sheep, or the firstling of a goat, Thou shalt not redeem, they are holy. Thou shalt dash their blood against the altar, and shalt make their fat smoke for an offering made by fire, for a sweet savor unto Jehovah. And the flesh of them shall be thine, as the wave breast, as the right thigh, it shall be thine. All the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer unto Jehovah, have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, as a do forever. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before Jehovah and thee and to thy seed with thee. So all of the first fruits and all of the firstborn amongst the beasts belong to the priests. So when the nation of Israel, you know, they reap their first fruits they, and they offer it as an offering unto Jehovah, that goes into the priests and to their families. When, you know, a firstling you know, of a clean beast, you know, is brought forth and the children of Israel brings it as an offering unto Jehovah, the flesh of that goes to the priests to eat. So, and it mentions that those, the firstborn of an unclean beast has to be redeemed, meaning that the children of Israel could buy those beasts back. You know, they had to pay them the money based on according to the beast, and they could redeem that unclean beast back. But, you know, because we know that an unclean animal can't go upon an altar, but amongst all the clean beasts, that must, ha that must be offered unto Jehovah, and the flesh of that is given unto the priest. So we see here that the Most High God is making it known to the priest what their portions are you know, amongst the offerings, you know, whether it's of the most holy, whether it's of the wave offerings, or whether, you know, whatever offering it is, it belongs to them. 
and definitely of the first fruits and of the firstborn, you know, of the animals, it belongs to the priests. But the firstborn amongst men of the children of Israel, once again, being that the Most High God has claimed all the firstborn of the nation of Israel unto him, that those males must be redeemed. And it specifies here with the five shekels that, is, that is, you know, must be paid, you know, for the redemption back unto the parents. And that money for that redemption goes to the priests as well. So all of the first and all of the best of the nation of Israel goes directly to the priests. Because the priests don't, you know, once again, as well as all of the tribe of Levi, don't receive a portion of land in the nation of Israel. So their life source, you know, of food and their sustenance, you know, depends totally on the nation of Israel bringing forth, you know, their first fruits and the firstborn of their animals unto them. Verse 20. Portions of the Levites. And Yehovah said unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shall thou have any portion among them. I am thy portion and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And unto the children of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service which they serve, even the service of the tent of meeting. And henceforth the children of Israel shall not come nigh the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites alone shall do the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statue forever throughout their generations, and among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the children of Israel, which they set apart as a gift unto Jehovah, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore I have said unto them, among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. So the Levites receive a portion for the nation of Israel as well, and the portion that they receive is the tithes that the nation of Israel will bring. Tithing comes from the crops that is grown or amongst the beasts that the nation of Israel raises. So being that the Levites don't receive an inheritance of land, and their, their responsibility is to serve at the tent of meeting and to also minister unto the priests and to help them and assist them with their job, but not going close to the job of the priests, that their payment for that job is the tithes of the nation of Israel. So we see here that the nation of Israel is providing for both the priests and the Levites. The, the priests are provided for, as read earlier, with the first fruits and the firstborns of the beasts, and the Levites are provided for from all of the tithes that the nation of Israel bring forth. And the nation of Israel has to be mindful of these things all throughout the year, that as they raise their animals and as they bring forth crops, that they have to bring forth the firstborn and the first fruits year by year, and they also have to bring forth the tithes year by year. And that would, must be distributed to the correct people, those that don't have an inheritance, which are the priests in order to tribe of Levi, so that they could do their job, and that would be their inheritance, you know, given to them and their portion given to them from the Most High God. But they have to make sure that they protect, you know, their duties as well, and make sure that no one steps, you know, the boundaries and try to do their job. Verse twenty-five: A tie for a tie. And Yehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Moreover, thou shalt speak unto the Levites and say unto them. When you take of the children of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for an inheritance, for your inheritance, then ye shall set a part of it a gift for Jehovah, even a tithe of a tithe. And the gift which ye set apart shall be reckoned unto you, as though it were the corn of the threshing floor, as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye also shall set apart a gift unto Jehovah of all your tithes which ye receive of the children of Israel, and thereof ye shall give the gift which is set apart unto Yehovah to Aaron the priest. Out of all that is given you, ye shall set apart all that which is due unto Yehovah of all the best thereof, even the hollow part thereof out of, of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when ye set apart the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the wine press. And Ye may eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward in return for your service in the tent of meeting. And ye shall bear no sin by reason of it, seeing that ye have set apart from it the best thereof. And ye shall promote profane, and ye sh shall not profane the holy things of the children of Israel, that ye die not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we see here that even the Levites, even though they don't have an inheritance of the land, they don't have crops that they would grow in order to give tithes unto the priests like the nation of Israel would give. 
what is given unto them, they have to give a tithe of that unto the priests. So the priests, you know, are, they're still they're receiving their first fruits. They're receiving the firstlings of the beasts. And they're also receiving the tithes of the tithes that the nation of Israel would give unto the Levites because the Levites have to tithe, you know, give forth their tithes unto the priests. And that would be counted to them as though they had an inheritance of land, growing crops and raising animals, when they separate a tenth for what is given unto them unto the priests. And unlike the first, the first fruits and the firstlings of the beasts that are presented at offerings, when it comes to tithing, that is basically, you know, for the sustenance of the Levites. So they don't, you know, that's not something that they would eat, you know, when they, you know, they would have to eat when they're clean or in a holy place because that's what they're eating to survive. You know, that's food that is given directly into them. So the same way when they also take a port, you know, the tenth of that and give it to the priests, the priests could treat that tithe in the same manner as the Levites would receive their tithes. So all around, we see that the nation of Israel supports the Levites. The Levites support the priests. We also see that the, the children of Israel directly support the priests as well. And everybody has to play, play their part and perform their functions. The priests have to guard you know, their duties. The Levites have to guard their duties. And the children of Israel have to make sure that they don't try to go forth and do the duties of the priests and the Levites. And basically, that's what this portion, you know, is cover, covering overall. It started off talking about the rebellion of Korach and those that were with him because they tried to go forth and to take over the priesthood. But all of, you know, all in all, it rounds off, you know, the portion discussing everybody's duties once again. And, you know, we read from the beginning of the book of Numbers, the book of Bemibar, up until this point, the portion that is given to everyone, you know, in the children of, of the children of Israel, amongst the priests, the Levites, and everyone else. And the Most High God, you know, will bless the nation, you know, once everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. The priests will survive, you know, once the children of Israel is doing what they're supposed to do, as well as the Levites will survive as well. And once again, the Levites have to play their part by making sure that they give forth their tithes unto the priests as well. So God has, you know, given a perfect system for the entire nation of Israel to give forth their offerings, to give him, you know, to give him thanks and to praise him, you know, from the crops that they grow and the animals that they raise. And the priests to give their praise to the Most High God by what they receive from the children of Israel and give him praise and thanks for that as well. So we thank the Most High God for being able to go into this portion, you know, the portion of Korach once again. And we ask that the Most High God will continue to teach us as we continue to go on in the Holy Scriptures, reading, you know, reading the word of the Most High God that would apply to us and to help us and to strengthen us. Hallelujah.